Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our morning worship at Richard Mission Church. My name is Mike Rogers, and I'm one of the leaders here, and it's good to welcome you into my home as we worship God together. I want to start by reading a passage from the Bible, and it's Psalm 4, and uh, it's written by King, King David, and it seems to be at a time of national crisis. And as David prays and addresses the people, we can see four different reactions to the situation in this psalm. I wonder if you could spot them as we read together. Psalm 4. Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful and hear my prayer. How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And as that nation faced that crisis, there were four reactions there. The first, there were those who gave up on God. The second reaction there was from those who let the anger get the better of them. The third reaction was from those who just sank into despair. But David, when he calls to mind uh, his experiences of God over his life and God's faithfulness to him, he is able to have a peace. So much so that even in that crisis, he was able to lie down and sleep. And we too can know that peace in our hearts and minds too. So let's pray together, shall we? We thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence today. And Lord, even though we can't meet up with you personally, we thank you that we can know your presence with us through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we remember that you've shown your faithfulness and your love to your people over many generations. And we thank you for the way you've expressed this in sending your son Jesus to be our saviour. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that we can find through him. And so, Lord, we pray that you will help us today as we praise you together, as we open your word. Lord, we pray that you will speak to us and thrill us anew with the wonder of what it is to know you, the eternal God as our Father, and your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as our Saviour. Amen. Well, we're now going to have our first hymn together, and if you want to stand or do however you feel comfortable to sing it, we're going to sing 10,000 Reasons. It is a song that reminds us of the many reasons that we have to praise our God together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship Love. 
strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy. to read God's word together and today's passage is about an incident in the life of the Apostle Peter, probably Jesus's most well-known disciple. And whenever I've preached at Lichard we've been going through the life of Peter, seeing all the lessons that we can learn from him. And we've seen him have great highs and we've also seen him have spectacular lows, the most famous being uh, on the night Jesus was betrayed and Peter denied that he ever knew Jesus three times. But after Jesus was raised from the dead, he remarkably restored Peter. And Peter found out firsthand just what God can do with failures. And then we moved into the book of Acts as Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to lead the church at Jerusalem. And uh, despite having two arrests and a good beating, he carried on to be bold in his leadership and in his proclamation of the good news of Jesus. But trouble is around the corner for Peter. And in today's passage, we're about to find out just what that trouble is. So let's look at Acts chapter 12 together, shall we? About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw this please the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was due in the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer was made to God for him by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He didn't know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them on its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realised this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognising Peter's voice, in her joy she did not open the gate but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, You're out of your mind. 
but she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept on saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hands to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. And just a few verses on, we read these words. The word of God increased and multiplied. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, we just thank you that we can come into your presence today. And we thank you that we can come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus and through what he has done for us. We thank you that through him we can know you. We can know your forgiveness and we can know your fellowship in our life. We thank you for the promises that you give us in your word. We thank you, Lord, that you uh, promised to be with us in trials and in difficult situations. Lord, we thank you that as we face difficult times uh, as a nation, Lord, we thank you that your people can know uh, your presence and your help. Lord, we thank you for our fellowship at Lichard. We thank you for placing us here as a group of your people. And we thank you for the privilege of supporting one another uh, in prayer and in love and in fellowship. Lord, we bring our needs before you as a church today. And Lord, we particularly pray for uh, Peter and David and Lisa, Lord, in their time of loss. And we just pray that you would just draw close to them, particularly through this coming week. We pray for our family around the world who are being persecuted just because they know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for those who are facing prison. We pray for those who are facing discrimination. We pray for those who are even uh, on death row, charged with blasphemy, just because they love the Lord Jesus. We pray that particularly today that you would draw close to them and give them a real sense of your presence. And Lord, we pray for our nation today. We pray for our government as they continue to make decisions, uh, as, they, as we lift the lockdown. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and help them in the decisions they make. Lord, we just pray that they might be just decisions and wise decisions. And as your people, help us to be patient and obedient and supportive as they try uh, to uh, work to uh, help us in this pandemic. Lord, we look around a world that is full of injustice and pain. And particularly today, we lift before you the family of George Floyd. And we pray that you would just help them at this time. Lord, that you would give them a sense of your comfort and, Lord, a sense of your peace as they mourn the loss of this man. Lord, we pray for the United States. We pray that you would bring calmness and peace into that land. But particularly, Lord, we just pray that you would bring justice into that situation. Lord, we thank you that we can look forward as your people to a time when Jesus will return and Lord, that he will bring in a kingdom of righteousness and justice and peace. And Lord, we long for that day. Lord, we come before you now as we approach uh, your word and we pray that you will speak to us later on from it. And Lord, help us to understand it. Lord, we thank you for being able to meet like this today. And we thank you for the freedom that we have to do this. But most of all, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, we're now going to sing another song together. And it's a very old hymn. It's a hymn for those of a certain age who will remember singing it in Sunday school days. And it's a hymn that helps us or asks us to rejoice in the fact that we have the privilege of prayer and being able to talk to God. And it's a very well-loved hymn. It's called What a Friend We Have in Jesus and uh, tells us that we should pray in each and every situation and uh, there will be a video uh, from the uh, sing an old song uh, group and uh, you, if you look carefully you probably will be able to see people from Lichard Mission in that audience there so let's sing this song together shall we what a friend we have in Jesus <laughs>
start of today's passage, we find Peter in serious trouble. Herod, in this case, Herod Agrippa I, had started to persecute the church. Now, he'd been a friend of both Caligula and Claudius when he was younger, so he was quite used to violence and intrigue. And we're told that the motivation behind his persecution was to please the Jews. And if he did that, no doubt he would make life easier for him as he governed the province. So at the beginning of chapter 12, we read that Herod had James, the brother of John, executed, and now his sights were turned on Peter. This Herod really meant business. But all this took place over Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so not to upset the Jews, he had Peter put in prison because it would have been wrong to have done anything uh, during that feast. And the feast was seven days long, so Peter spent those days kept in prison, awaiting his fate. And he would have been under heavy guard, we read. There would have been a soldier either side of him and uh, uh, chained to him. And also there would have been one outside the cell and another one in the corridor, making sure he could not escape. And there would have been four squads of these soldiers so they could change guard every three hours. You see, this was a situation that not even Houdini could get out of. So how does the church respond? Well, we read in verse 5 that they prayed. It almost seems pathetic, doesn't it? Against all the might of Rome, a ragtag group of people pray. I mean, what good would that do? And what do they pray for? The answer is we're not told. Now, it's easy to assume, isn't it, that they prayed for Peter's release. But Luke doesn't tell us that. Indeed, if we look back in Acts chapter 4, we get a glimpse of just how the church prayed. Because when faced with threats from the Jewish uh, religious leaders, uh, they did not pray that the threats would go away. Rather, they prayed that they would have boldness to stand up to those threats. So what Luke focuses on is not so much what they prayed, but how they prayed. And the word he uses is earnestly. And that word means fervently and continuously. Fervent prayer. That was in the DNA of the early church. In fact, we read later on that they would pray into the early hours of the morning. And they would hand anything and everything over to God. And I find the prayer life of the early church such a great challenge to my prayer life. And then the scene switches back to Peter in prison. And it was the night before he was about to be brought out and face the people's anger. And in verse 6 we're told that Peter slept. In fact, we're told that he slept so deeply that the angel who came to rescue him had to give him quite a poke to wake him up. Now that's an incredibly unusual thing to do the night before your possible execution. I mean, could you sleep in those circumstances? And I guess although we're not told the reasons he was able to sleep so well, I think I have a few ideas I'd like to share with you. Firstly, despite his circumstances, as he lay there, Peter could hold on to the promises of Jesus. And Peter's mind could go back to the time before Jesus was about to face his own trial and be crucified. And he could remember that in those apparently dire circumstances, Jesus promised his followers that their long term future was secure. And these were the words of Jesus that night. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. There where I am, you may be also. Whatever happens next, Jesus said to his followers that night, it's all part of my plan. And it's all about your long term security. I have things in hand. And regardless of what happens, don't be afraid. Just trust in me, regardless of the circumstances. And that's a great promise for Peter to hold on to. And then Peter could look back to the time just before Jesus returned to heaven. And in that time, Jesus charged his disciples with the work of spreading the gospel, taking the news out to the nations. And the last thing that Jesus did before he went back to heaven was to give them a promise. 
And Peter could remember those words, and they're these. Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And knowing God's presence in those circumstances for Peter would have been a great comfort and encouragement. And then he could look back on the occasion where Jesus warned him and the other disciples that situations like this would arise in their lives. And he gave them reassuring words. Listen to what Jesus said. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So in prison, as Peter has time to reflect on his situation, he had all these promises from Jesus to draw to his mind and to his attention. And from them, he could take comfort and courage. You see, Peter wasn't alone in that place. And regardless of what happened next, he could uh, be assured of God's presence and help. And that gave him <clears throat> great peace. But secondly, as Peter lay there, he could also rely on the prayers of the church in Jerusalem because he could think, whatever is going on in here, I know that out there, my fellow believers are praying for me. Because Peter knew that to the church of Jerusalem, prayer was their default position. It was their go-to response for anything and every situation. And he knew that from first hand because before he was arrested, he was part of their prayer life. He knew he could trust them to pray for him. It was something they always did. Then thirdly, as Peter approached the trial and probable death, he had a healthy perspective on life because knowing Jesus and learning from him had given Peter's life a different perspective. Before he'd met Jesus, life was different. But since he'd met Jesus, he had a different perspective on life. And we can read this through Peter's own writings. You see, this is how Peter puts it in his own words. He says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. And then he goes on to say, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And later on in that letter, Peter writes this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. You see, Peter had a heavenly perspective on things. He had what he himself called a living hope. And that eternal hope, as he calls it, was to meet with Jesus, the one who had gone to prepare a place for him. And to Peter, suffering in this life, well, that was just part of the package. And that heavenly perspective made a huge difference in Peter's life. After all, Peter writes, this life is not what it's all about. And that attitude makes such a huge difference in face and life. And it's an attitude that we find in all God's faithful people. In the book of Hebrews and in chapter 11, we read of many uh, Old Testament heroes of faith. They all had different circumstances. Some enjoyed great triumphs and others endured great suffering. But they all had one thing in common. They all looked forward to a future hope that was not in this life, but that hope was in the life to come. And that is the hope that for all who trust in Jesus. So let's go back to our passage. In the midst of such trying circumstances, we find Peter can sleep and can sleep soundly. Until that is, he gets a poke. And as this happens, chains fall off. Doors and gates open, and Peter is remarkably delivered. But we're told that it was such a steep sleep that he thought he was having some sort of a dream or some sort of a vision. That was until he realised he was standing alone in a dark street in the early hours. 
It's as if Peter wasn't expecting that to happen. So where does he go? Well, he goes to where he knew he could find the church, to a woman's house called Mary. And in verse 12, we're told a big gathering was there praying. And the next pass, piece of the passage is almost comical, isn't it? For as Peter knocks the door, a young girl answers, and she's so excited to see him that she leaves him outside and runs in to disturb the prayer meeting and says, it's Peter, it's Peter. And then they, in uh, an act of faith, turn around and say, don't be silly. So first of all, Peter can't quite believe what's happening to him, and then neither can the church. And they all seem to be taken by surprise at what God has just done. And yet aren't we told that this is the God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ever ask or think? You see, if we put limitations on what God can do, he doesn't. And so we find at the end of the narrative, Peter is safe. And if we read on, we could see that Herod had been dealt with. And then when we get to verse 24, Luke inserts one of his summary statements. And to sum up this section of church history, he writes, the word of God increased and multiplied. And what Luke is saying is this, despite the opposition the church experienced, despite uh, all that happened in the early chapters of Acts, despite everything that was thrown at it, the church just kept on growing. What a great ending to the section. And that's where we leave the New Testament church, excitedly enjoying unexpected fellowship with Peter. And now we come back to our own time and we ask uh, the, the question, it's a nice story, but what has it got to do with me? Well, if I can focus on two lessons with you and one big question that comes out of this passage. The first lesson is this. Peter's peace. How could Peter have such a peace in a prison cell uh, the night before his execution that he sleeps so soundly? How can he have that kind of a peace? And is it possible for me to know something of that peace in my life? Because I guess in many ways, we too are all now living in uncertain and even scary times. Life is difficult, isn't it? Let's face it. And even though the issues are different, life is tough. <laughs> right now, we face a threat we cannot see, a threat that exerts huge power over populations around the world, and its effects may well be with us for some time to come. And many people are anxious. And that's a natural response, isn't it? Particularly as we can only look at a future that seems very uncertain. But it's not the only possible reaction. For if what I read from the Bible is correct, then we too can know a peace in our lives, even through the most difficult of circumstances. Because the promises Jesus made to his followers are to his followers, no matter what generation they live in or where they live. And those promises are just as true today as they were to those first disciples. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us if we trust in him. He has promised to be with us always, no matter the circumstances. And you know, for many Christians around the world, at our time, that will indeed mean that they are being taken before authorities to answer charges because they love Jesus. And some of them will even be put in prison and even killed because they love Jesus. Do you know, we too can have that peace that comes from having an eternal perspective on life too, can't we? Do you know, life can be really tough on times, can't it? But this is not all of it. It's only part of it. And the biggest part, says Peter, the best part, the eternal part, is for those who trust in the Lord Jesus, is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for us. And you know, although life is tough for all of us, the Bible tells us that there is indeed more to life than this. Because in Jesus, we find that we have a hope. And that hope can give us what the Bible calls us 
calls rather, a peace that passes all understanding. A peace that is out of keeping with our circumstances and that can guard our hearts and minds as we trust in our Lord Jesus. And that was what Peter enjoyed in this passage. And that's what David joy enjoyed in that psalm. And that's what God wants us to enjoy too. But the second thing we can learn from this passage is this. Just have a look at the prayer life of that early church. Look at how those early Christians prayed. They prayed wherever they could and they prayed whenever they could. So here's the question. How is your prayer life, Little Mission Church? What words would you use to characterise it? How big a place does prayer have in the life of our church? Do you know, last night we had a wonderful time meeting together. There were a, a good few of us meeting together over Zoom, praying and having fellowship together. And uh, when the lockdown's over, we meet on Tuesday afternoons and on a Wednesday evening to pray. Let me ask you, if you are a member of Lichard Mission Church, and if you are able-bodied, don't you think that you should be able to get out to one of those meetings? Do you know we've suggested that uh, we have uh, prayer partners and prayer triplets within the church. And now with lockdown being lifted, we can now meet up at a social distance and meet up with one another to pray. Now, does that excite you? And when we do pray, what is our prayer like? Is it full of passion? Is it full of passion like it was for these people? Samuel Chadwick once said, intensity is a law of prayer. I think what he meant was this, the passion we have when we pray is directly related to the importance of the issue we are praying for and how much we feel we need God's help in that situation. The problem for our church in the West in our, in our time is that often we are tempted to self-reliance rather than God-reliance. But there's another lesson and another challenge for us is this is we see that the church in New Testament times prayed for those in prison. So let me ask you, do you pray for those who are in prison? Do you pray for those who are suffering because they follow Jesus? In the book of Hebrews, the writer says this, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Do you know the brutal reality of life in the 20th century is this. More Christians around the world are suffering for their faith today than at any other time in church history. And here's the question. Do we pray for them? Pray for them? Because if we truly are one with the church around the world, should we not be praying with our brothers and sisters as they face persecution? Here are some staggering figures from Open Doors Ministry. It's a group that monitors and supports, uh, monitors persecution and supports the persecuted church. These are some figures from 2019. Right now, 310 million Christians living around the world face high or extreme levels of persecution for their faith. In 2019, attacks against churches around the world rose from just over 1,800 to now just under 9,500. That's an increase of 500%. Much of that is due to uh, the actions of authorities in China. In 2019, 2,983 Christians are known to have been killed for their faith. At the moment, many of those killings occur in uh, one country, that's Nigeria. And God calls us to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering for their faith. He calls us to be one with them in prayer. Now, do you do that? Now, if you don't, and you'd like to know how to get involved in praying for the persecuted church, can I direct you to the work of Open Doors and to Barnabas Fund, who print monthly prayer diaries so you can support uh, our brothers and sisters around the world who face danger on a daily basis just because they love the Lord Jesus. 
And I think you'll find the details of these uh, printed on our website so you can find how to contact them. Finally, this message leave, uh, this passage rather, leaves us with a big question, doesn't it? And here it is. Why did God rescue Peter and yet let James be executed? Have you ever wondered that? Was it because the church didn't pray enough for James? Or was it because they were taken by surprise? Well, my answer to that question is, I just don't know. But I'd like to share two stories with you that I think might help. The first considers a chap called John Patton. And John Patton was a Scottish ministry, uh, missionary rather, and he went to the New Hebrides Islands in the South Pacific back in the 1800s. And he recounts the story that one night hostile tribesmen surrounded his mission station, intent on burning it down and killing both Patton and his wife. And so they prayed all night. And in the morning, to their surprise, the tribesmen had all gone. A year later, the tribal chief became a Christian, so Patton asked him, what stopped you from burning down our station that night and killing us? And this was his reply. My men saw hundreds of large men with drawn swords in their hands around your station, and they were too afraid to attack. And Patton realised that God had sent angels to protect them. And yet that same John Patton's first wife died in childbirth, and the baby that she delivered uh, died 17 days later. And that was despite John Patton's fervent prayers. He even had to dig the graves for his wife and child. And that was early in his missionary career. And this is what John, John Patton wrote about that situation. He said, I was never altogether forsaken. God sustained me to lay the precious dust of my loved ones in the same grave. But for Jesus and the fellowship he vouchsafed me, I would have gone mad beside that lonely grave. So the God that was able to rescue him was the God that gave him sufficient grace to carry on his work, even when he came under such tragic circumstances. And as a result of him continuing that work, many came to faith in the Lord Jesus. The second story I want to share with you is about the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. He was a man who was used to heal many. And yet in 2 Corinthians, he shared a personal health issue with his readers. He called it his thorn in the flesh. And he says that many times he went to God and said, Lord, will you take it away from me? And this is the answer he got. God said, no, but my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul went on to say that he was able to even boast about his weaknesses because through them, God had enabled him to experience a power in his life that he could not do any other way. And so my answer to the question, I guess, is that sometimes God in his wisdom delivers us. But sometimes in his wisdom, he doesn't. But he always brings his grace and comfort into each situation that we face. Talking about Jesus as a great high priest in Hebrews 4, we read these words. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in our time of need. And what the writer is saying there is that God is not remote and indifferent to the difficulties and the pain that we have in mind, because Jesus has experienced them too. And so when we pray, we come before someone who understands, someone who knows exactly what we feel like. Sometimes he provides us with a way out of our difficulties. And sometimes he doesn't. But here's the promise. He always will go through them with us. You know, in the days ahead, we will all face difficult situations. 
Things like being distanced from those we long to be close to. We will experience fears for our own health and for our loved ones. We will experience fears for our jobs. We will experience financial worries, perhaps. And as we face them, this might even be the first time you have ever thought of turning to prayer. And here's a question you might ask. Will it do any good if I pray? Will God deliver me from the situation? All I can say is this. Maybe God will deliver you from the situation. Maybe he won't. I don't know. But I do know this. God does understand your situation and he will be with you whatever your circumstances to give you sufficient grace and to help you see them through if you receive it. For regardless of what this life throws at us, the Bible tells us that if we trust him, his grace is sufficient. And that knowledge can bring us great peace, even in times such as these. We're now going to sing our last hymn, which is uh, by Graham Kendrick. And it's just uh, a hymn where he tells us the difference that knowing Jesus makes in his life. And it's called All I Once Held Dear. So if you understand, uh, we'll sing this together now.
Well, I do hope you enjoyed your time with us today. Adam will be back next week and hopefully so will Colin. If you have any questions that have come from today's message, you want to get in contact with us, uh, our details uh, are on our website and we'd love to hear from you. And if you live in the Lichard area and you have anything you might need help with, please contact us as well. Or if you'd just like someone to talk to you, uh, we'd love to do that. Uh, our, our details are on the website. So thank you very much for being with us. We look forward to seeing you next week. Well, let's just close with a word of prayer then, shall we? Lord, we thank you for the difference that knowing you can make in our lives. We thank you for the comfort that it gives us. We thank you for the hope that it gives us, particularly as we, uh, many of us, face such difficult circumstances. And Lord, we just commit each and every one of us to you and just pray that we might know your presence throughout this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to close with the grace now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.